Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Offstage with the New York Philharmonic at Barnes & Noble. I'm Jeff Spurgeon from WQXR. And, and on my left is the marvelous Susan Graham, who appears this week with the New York Philharmonic to start her, her 2008 work in New York after a fabulous 2007 close at the other house just across the plaza at Lincoln Center at Thank the you. Metropolitan Opera. Congratulations on Ethan Jamie on Thank you. Thank you. You've sung the role, you sung this role in lots of houses around the world. Iphigenie, yeah. yes. Yeah. I've, I started the Iphigenie tour in 2000 at the Salzburg Festival. And um, then I had a little hiatus of about seven years. And uh, then sang it again in, in uh, Paris, uh, in the, actually six years, in Paris in the summer of 2006, wasn't it? Or was it seven? Seven, I think it was. God, I can't remember. And then Chicago, San Francisco, London, and New York, all within a span of 18 months. So I got to know Iphigenie very well. <laughs> Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of laughs in that opera. <laughs> and as you can imagine, I'm, it sort of goes against my personality. But, um, but it, was a, it was a wonderful experience and so great to spend that much time with one character because, you know, we think we know a character when we've done one or two runs of it. And then suddenly you get another director's take on it or you get another cast member who comes in and the dynamic changes and suddenly it's a whole new piece. And then to get in to sort of explore the depths and the layers of meaning with all of these amazing epic characters you know it's it was it was a real journey it was a real journey and she was a a good traveling companion for those 18 months how does how does the role change house to house do you do you adapt for this for the a house that's of a different size or in a different place you know it's funny um, the Robert Carson production that we did that started in Chicago went to San Francisco and then to London um, was adapted slightly for the British audience. How so? Um, well, when we did it in Chicago, Robert Carson was there, and so he was very hands-on, you know, and he's a very, uh, he, he, he gives you free reign to sort of discover the uh, ins and outs of the character on your own and your, and your relationship with the other characters and this, um, just the, the way that the, that the piece unfolds. But then in the, in the revival in San Francisco, he wasn't there. So the reins got very loose. <laughs> <laughs> well, that can be good and bad, though. Well, exactly. We, we had a lot of you know, growth within, within, the, within the production. Paul Groves and I were the constants in all of those different productions. And then the, the Orestes changed. Um, the first one was Lucas Meacham. The second one was Bo Scofus. And in London, it was Simon Keenley's side. All those guys are very different. So, and they all played my brother. And of course, here at the Met, it was Placido Domingo, who's unlike any of them, of course. <laughs> First and foremost, he's a tenor. But, um, <laughs> but when, he, when he needs to be. Yeah, he you know, he's very be. flexible these days. Yeah. Um, but once we got to London, and it was also Robert Carson's debut at Covent Garden, so he wanted to, you know, he wanted to just tighten it up. And he said, we got a little out of control in San Francisco. So he, uh, he wanted to sort of bring it back to a, a sort of more contained essence. Um, in, a, in the sense of what his vision was or in the sense of sort of approaching the ideal of the mythical characters when you talk about contained? Both, both. Um, he just had an idea of who this girl was and, and, that, and that she she was more of a sort of an, an internal character rather than a, a, an explosive sort of outward character which is I guess how I had gotten through the <laughs> Through the, the Surprising in yeah, your I know. Case. I'm so, normally so shy and retiring, but how do you get to know a character in, in in an opera? It takes some time to learn the music, the notes, the words. How much of the character is revealed there, and how much of it comes out in interactions with other performers? When do you really know? When did you know Iphigenia? You're always getting to know them. You know, I've done probably close to at least 100 performances of Octavian. I'm still getting to know him, you know, because the, the dynamic changes. Every time you've got a new Marshallin, you know, the, 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 the interaction is different. You know, with, with Felicity Lott, for instance, with whom I sang it very early in my Octavian experience, um, 
you know, she's, she's a, a grand dame of the, of the British tradition, you know, and she's, she's very elegant and she's quite reserved, although she can be just as rowdy as anybody when, when you know, <laughs> the opportunity arises. And then there's, you know, the many times I've done it with Renee Fleming. And we're contemporaries and we're really good friends. And so the dynamic there is very different. You know, there's a certain level of freedom you can accomplish with some people. Then there's a certain reserve seems more appropriate with other people. You know, it's, 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 it's like that. But, but the, I, I always start from the text and the music, from what I see in the book. That, what the composer and the librettist has put down, in my opinion, is the direction that the character wants to go. Of course I do, you know, historical research. Of course I read the mythology of Iphigenie and, and you know, for my upcoming performances this weekend, of course I've researched Cleopatra. <laughs> but really what the composer puts down is his idea of it and the librettist. So that's really the jumping off point. Right. Well, then let's talk about uh, the death of Cleopatra. This was one of uh, Berlioz's attempts to get the Prix de Rome. Didn't get it. He got it eventually. He was in the conservatory in Paris right. when he wrote this piece. And the requirements for the Prix de Rome are you have to write a cantata which at the time, well, I don't know, it, would, it would seems a little odd today, but it, that was the convention at, at the moment. And so Berlioz wrote the deaths of, I don't know, 18 or 45 Ophelia different people. And, yeah. and the death Cleopatra of fill in the blank yeah. <laughs> in effort to get the Prix de Rome. Um, and Cleopatra was sort of in the, in the midst of this. So, this was like his third attempt or something, wasn't it? Yeah, I think that's right. So who is she in this piece? Who does Berlioz make Cleopatra? She's, she's this is obviously the death of Cleopatra. This is at the end. <laughs> um, but she, but she's, she's reflecting on her former glories and her, you know, there are, she goes through many moods. I see her as, I mean, it, it has a real contemporary feel to it. She's, she's like a contemporary, very powerful woman who is seeing her empire collapse in front of her. You know, she says, I, I've, I've been the wife of two incredibly powerful men. Anthony and Caesar, and, and she, she mourns the fact that she screwed it up. She said, it's my fault that, that uh, you know, the, the empires have fallen, and it's my fault that the religions have failed, and, and I am not worthy. Am I worthy to be buried in the tombs of the kings? No, I'm not. So the only recourse that I have is to kill myself, and then maybe I'll be worthy of being the wife of Caesar again. So she goes through severe mood swings. <laughs> severe. Hormone therapy would yeah. have just removed the whole piece. It, it would, would have been a... It would never have been written. <laughs> I'm glad she didn't have it right. then. Berlioz is so astonishing. He was outlandish in his day. And even today, oh. the music is just so vital. I think that there, there's, there's one particular chord progression, and it's in the beginning of the long sustained meditation piece. And it's, you know, these chord, chromatic chord progressions that just sort of go not where you think they're going to go. And I heard that he got thrown out of conservatory for that passage because it was so out there. But, you know, and, and the other day I was, I was having a coaching on it or something, and my coach said, after one particularly sort of wandery phrase, she said, well, that was a big swig of absinthe. <laughs> <laughs> it may have been something more than absinthe, if you want to know the truth. Oh, that's, but that's, that's, <laughs> that's a terrific, is. terrific way to look at it. Yeah, he's <laughs> always, always fresh and surprising. So uh, you haven't worked with Lauren Moselle before? Not officially. I reminded him today was our first rehearsal. And I reminded him that in something like 1995 or six, maybe, he was conducting Rosen Cavalier in Salzburg, and Anne Murray was the Octavian. And one day, and I was there doing Carabino or something, a completely other production. But I had just done my first Octavian like the year before or something. And one day Anne Murray was sick and couldn't come to a, a piano staging rehearsal. And so the um, administration called me and said, we know you're not on this show officially, but would you just come over and just be the, be the Octavian du jour today? And, and so I did, and, and I sort of asked him today if he remembered that, and he said, yes, I do remember that. And I remember thinking what a good sport you were. <laughs> I said, good sport. That's you. Yeah. That's you. Back when I was a baby Octavian. 